Welcome everybody to the joint ESOW's O conference. My name is Martin Dichkanz. I'm the director of the Institute for Stroke and Dementia Research at LMU Munich and president of the European Stroke Organization, ESO. I'm here with Mark Bakker, first author of a genome-wide association study of intracranial aneurysms that revealed 17 risk loci, genetic overlap with clinical risk factors and opportunities for treatment. Also with me is Laura Ibanez, first author of a study on genetic influences on early neurological instability after acute ischemic stroke. Dr. Bakker is an investigator at the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery at Utrecht University, the Netherlands. And Dr. Ibanez is an assistant professor at the psychiatry department at Washington University School of Medicine, USA. The results of their studies, both of which represent landmark studies, are presented at this conference. So thanks to both of you for joining this interview. If you allow, I will start with your study, Mark. Could you explain what you and your collaborators did and what you found? Yes, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Martin. Very pleased to, uh, to talk here. Um, we conducted a genetic study on intracranial aneurysms, so-called genome-wide association study. Uh, which was a large international collaboration with uh, investigators from 14 countries. Um, we collected DNA from 10,000 cases with uh, intracranial aneurysms, either unruptured or with aneurysm of subarachnoid hemorrhage, and 300,000 controls or from the general population. Um, so for each of those persons, we collected DNA and we measured um, genetic markers, millions of genetic markers on their DNA. We tested whether they were more common in cases versus controls or the other way around to see if we find an association. Um, and as kind of a key finding, we identified 17 of those risk loci of the genome, independent of one another, that passed our stringent uh, threshold for statistical significance. So I think this is already very exciting, Mark. Um, um, I, I was intrigued in, in, in hearing your presentation. I was intrigued um, about not only the step increase in the number of loci that you identified uh, in your study, but also about the potential um, implications for therapeutics and uh, for diagnosis um, and risk prediction. Do you want to comment on that? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so the work really doesn't stop at identifying those risk loci. We really wanted to know kind of what that means and what that does. Um, so I think there, there are several um, ways that we can kind of get uh, clinical um, or clinical information from this. Um, so first of all, we want to understand the disease, um, but I uh, also want to predict risk, uh, as you mentioned, and, and uh, treat um, the patients. Um, so there, there are a lot of things, but I, I want to pick a few of those out. Um, so one of the things we can do is risk prediction. I think that's one of the the, the, the nice things to do next. So we identified a lot of um, significant risk factors, uh, but also below that significant threshold, there is a lot of information. If you combine all this genetic information, we can now explain 20% uh, of the disease, which is half of what all genetics would explain. So it's quite a, quite a lot, and it's more than we typically see um, for other diseases. So it really gives perspective for the potential of genetic risk prediction. Um, and the actual genetic risk prediction is something that we're working on now as, as a follow-up uh, study. Um, and uh, so the other aspects, the kind of more therapeutic value, uh, one of the um, key findings um, in that area, so we looked at the genes that we found in our study and we tested whether these genes are targets of existing and approved drugs for other diseases. Um, and we actually found two of those uh, drug classes that were enriched. First of all, are uh, sex hormone related drugs, which I think makes a lot of sense uh, given that women have uh, a two times higher chance of getting intracranial aneurysm, three times higher uh, of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, but the second class were anti epileptics, which was quite a yeah, surprise to me. Um, um, so, this is a developing field, this, this um, enrichment of genetic drug targets. So there, there, there are a lot of questions still there, um, but I think it's a nice first 
uh, hint that we have potential for a treatment, hopefully in the future, for, for this disease. And uh, if, if, I, if I may ask uh, another question, does this mean um, that there would be an opportunity for repurposing drugs, uh, for instance, anti-epileptic drugs in the future to what? Prevent intracranial aneurysms or to prevent rupture? Uh, one aspect that you might want to briefly comment on is whether the genes that you identified or the genes loci, whether they actually differed between unruptured aneurysms and um, the ruptured aneurysms. Yes, that, that is one of the big open questions. <laughs> what are we going to treat? Um, and yeah, to comment on that, we included persons with unruptured intracranial aneurysms and with aneurysms of subarachnoid hemorrhage. We also analyzed those separately. And we looked whether we could provide additional risk factors specific for rupture. Um, and maybe surprising, maybe not, we didn't find any. So instead we found a genetic correlation of nearly 100% between the unruptured and the ruptured um, uh, aneurysms, meaning that the genetic risk factors are, are nearly similar, are nearly identical. I noted that you found uh, smoking and blood pressure amongst the risk factors that in the Mendelian randomization approach were causally associated or related to uh, aneurysm risk. Did you also explore whether there is a linear relationship or could you speculate on whether the, this relationship is linear in nature? Yeah, so indeed, using the Mendelian randomization, we found that both the genetic risks for blood pressure, variance in blood pressure, and for smoking, which is also slightly uh, genetic, uh, are causal for, for intracranial aneurysms. So the way this technique is, um, is developed is that we're estimating a linear relationship. So that doesn't mean that, that it is. <laughs> that, that, um, so, so the effect size that we see is from a linear relationship, but it doesn't exclude the possibility that in kind of the extreme ends, we may see additional risk. So we, do, we wouldn't know that. That was very interesting, Mark. Thank you very much. And um, I can only encourage everybody who wants to look at this presentation um, to, um, to step into our uh, uh, virtual uh, possibilities and, and have a look at the uh, presentation by Mark uh, over the next few days or weeks, whenever you have time. So yeah. thanks again, Mark. And uh, I would now like to uh, turn to you, Laura, and maybe you can already switch on your micro microphone. And um, so uh, Laura, as I mentioned, is the first author um, of a study um, on genetic influences on early neurological instability after acute ischemic stroke. And again, Laura, I would be very interested to hear from you um, what you did and what you found. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you for having, a, having me. And um, what so basically, most of the studies that are outside, they, they try to check risk for stroke, risk for <clears throat> aneurysm, et cetera. And what we wanted to see, it's not the risk of stroke, but is there any genetic influence on the early hours after a stroke? So does any genomic region help getting better recovery or you know, getting worse? And <clears throat> so we used a linear phenotype, not a case control approach. And to do that, um, Dr. Lee and Dr. Kruchaga, they um, build up this study called Genesis. And uh, my talk is the final results of this study or the first batch of samples, because we don't know if we are going to recruit more. So basically what we did is um, use the NIH stroke scale at 24 hours minus the delta ID NIH stroke scale at six hours to measure these first hours of recovery. So if delta is positive, people is getting better. If delta is negative, people is getting worse. And we use the, that as phenotype for our, for our GWAS. And the, one of the characteristics of our GWAS is that we um, not only included European ancestry individuals, we recruited from all around the world and we had mm -hmm. six countries. We had Asian population, Latino, Europeans, and African-Americans. And to try to collect all these um, genetic variability that can interfere with your results, we use a Bayesian approach uh, so um, <clears throat> to minimize these ethnic differences. And by using this phenotype and these 6,000 individuals coming from all around the world, we found um, seven loci that were associated with these first hours of recovery. Um, but again, when you do a GWAS, you have a genomic 
region full of genes or not. And you need to understand, okay, what's the gene driving that association? How do we point that out? So I spend most of my time doing um, functional annotation using databases, Mendelian randomization, to see which was the gene driving for each loci the association. And I would like to highlight a couple of them, which one is in chromosome two, it's uh, by Mendelian randomization and EQTL analysis, we think that uh, the gene driving that association is ADAM23. And another one on chromosome five, by doing the same, we think it's GRIA1. And it's very interesting because those two genes interact at protein level through a mediator protein that can be ADAM23 or PGL3. And, and those two uh, are involved in excitotoxic reactions, well, reactions, um, responses, sorry. And, and so we think that it's, you know, we have demonstrated for the first time in humans that excitotoxic mechanisms are involved in stroke recovery. So this is the main um, takeaway message from our uh, study. Yeah, thanks, Laura. I think this is uh, a truly exciting. When I heard your presentation, I, I got really excited because uh, it's not only an extremely innovative approach, but it's also uh, giving us very important uh, results. And obviously, the convergence that you see with two of these genes or loci on excitatory neurons um, not only makes sense, but also is very important. I would like you to speculate on what this would offer in terms of uh, therapeutic approaches or what the next uh, steps could be in your investigation. Did you already turn towards um, animal models or in vitro studies to functionalize these variants or these genes? And um, do you think it would make sense to, to dive into any particular uh, therapeutic targets here? Yeah, um, so we have turned to animal models, um, thanks to Dr. Lee, he has several um, chemic stroke uh, mice. And we started with ADAM23, which is the, you know, the signal that we are more confident that it's driven, driven by gene, that gene. And um, he stained some brains with ADAM23, and we see that ADAM23 is um, not expressed in the ischemic region and almost not expressed in the healthy region, but in the uh, penumbra region, all the region that it's sort of working on keeping that ischemic stroke at bay. So um, that, you know, we were very excited about this. So, um, and we also know from animal models that ADAM23 is a very important gene because if you knock it out, um, the mice, it's lethal. They, they are not, I mean, they die very, very soon. I'm not sure if they um, get birth or they, they die before that, but they, it's lethal. So I think it's a very important gene that we need to understand if we can target it, what do we have to do? Overexpress it or um, downregulate it. We, we we are not sure if we need to put it up or down to get the re stroke recovery better. But I think that's exciting. So, and the EQTL data that you mentioned on, which apparently were not related to the brain, but in other organs, from what I understand, do they inform you already on the directionality of the effect? In other words, is it rather that Adam twenty three is upregulated or downregulated, and could you speculate, or would there be any specific drugs that would target, for instance, inhibitors that would target these, um, these um, molecules? So, yes, but because it's not in brain, I wasn't 100%, we are not feeling 100% confident. But there are two evidences that apparently higher ADAM23 goes with better uh, or more positive delta NIH stroke scale, meaning getting better. Um, one is the Mendelian randomization. It's true that the correlation between the um, betas for the EQTL and the betas for the delta NIH stroke scale G was, they seem to be positively correlated. So as more delta, uh, as more the ADAM23, more, more delta. And, mm -hmm. and the other one is we did, um, we um, divided our population in the genotype, uh, uh, homozygote major, heterozygous and homozygous minor. And we also see a trend towards the homozygous minors for the top uh, SNP from our loci seems to same thing, higher ADAM23 with higher delta NIH stroke scale. So well, that's, that's in there. Th thank you very much, Laura. Um, um, again, I mean, these, these are uh, enormously uh, important and exciting results from both of your studies. From what I understand, 
the papers will um, will soon come out, at, at least uh, in, in, in one of your cases, and so that the audience will have an opportunity to look into it um, very soon. And um, I, I, I would like to thank both of you for sharing your results, for presenting them at our joint uh, ESO WSO conference. And um, um, I, I hope you will also enjoy uh, this conference, which just started and um, Hope to see you soon and also the audience um, at this joint virtual conference, hopefully also personally in soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you too.